Well, Jester's standing in the world of choral music is as, is as a legend. Jester's standing in the world of choral music is as a legend. Uh, sometimes legends are created by what they do. Sometimes they're created by simply being around for a very long while, and he's done both. So in the, in the world of choral music and musicians, he's been known for many, many years and has just become a part of that fabric. Uh, plus, he has made a contribution to the understanding of the Afro-American tradition that's unparalleled by anyone else, I think. What has been your association with Jester in the past? Where did you first meet him? How, how has that progressed? Well, I first met him at conventions of. I first met Jester. I first met Jester oh. at. I first met Jester at uh, conventions of choral conductors, where he was often a presenter, and then in my early years as conductor here, on several occasions, he visited rehearsals while he was working in the area, and we introduced him to the choir, and he talked to the choir a little bit. Then in 1982, as a result of a choral workshop that was being held at BYU, we were able to obtain his services as a clinician, and he came on a Thursday night and worked in a rehearsal with the choir, which was a delightful experience for us all. Is there any specific anecdotes that you remember of those times or things that you remember about Jester that might be memorable? Always the thing that I remember is his unique personality and his winning way with the people he's working with. He's not a sophisticated presenter. It's just a very warm, real human experience. Let's talk about you know, his, his style. How, how does he differ then from, from other conducting? And how, how, how is it unique? Well, he doesn't approach it from a musical point of view technically. Jester approaches his work from the substance of the spirituals themselves, where they came from, who sang them, under what circumstances they were sung, and weaves his whole uh, presentation of the piece of music through that element, and it becomes very intriguing to the people who are, he's working with. Let's explore a little bit, again, Jester's contribution, in your eyes, to the, to the spiritual. Well, he's given us an appreciation of the fact that this was... Let's start again. Let's say Jester's given us... Jester has given us an... I'm a, I, I don't want to walk on top of your answer. So okay. Jester has given us an appreciation of the people that spawned this music, where it came from, uh, so that the music itself, although it's somewhat simplistic and stylistic in its nature, becomes living to us because it represents people in a particular period of our history. Let's explore. We'll do all these lights and we'll go into it. Oh, okay. Try to start. Yeah. Um, let's explore the, the from the Tabernacle Choir's perspective how, what we could explore with Jester's contribution or what he's accomplishing here. Uh, or the, the experience. How, how is the choir, again, well, I think we're, we're now trying to speak in past tense as mm -hmm. in, in future tense. Can you? take a wild guess and anticipate what's uh, they're in for tonight. Jester will bring a kind of uh, spontaneity to the work of the Tabernacle Choir as he has done in the work that he's done with them simply because the history of the Tabernacle Choir is a rather formal stereotyped kind of thing. Uh, broadcasting, which is a very formalized kind of thing, concertizing, which is generally very formalized. Uh, and as a result, he, oh, That's right. he, he made his first mistake. I can't believe it. We were going to use the actual footage. Okay. That's great. <laughs> Sorry, you got to edit something. That's right. You've got, to have got to earn your money. Thank one. you. And Mark can charge something for editing now. All right. What were we talking about? <laughs> I only have part-timers. <laughs> uh, gestures, uh, uh, the, the choirs, well, we're anticipating, now I, I want to change it a little bit, as if Jester's already working Yeah, I, I got started off on the wrong foot, too. So he's, so we're, we're, we're reminiscing now on Jester's interaction with the choir. It's obvious from the looseness that, the, that Jester elicited from the choir in terms of their personalities that this is not a known quantity for the Tabernacle Choir, being a rather formal organization. Uh, 
for many, many years, the choir did nothing but broadcast and do formal concerts. About 25 years ago, that began to change when the record companies asked them to do some lighter repertoire and they began doing Broadway music. But we've never really, uh, although we've done spirituals, absorbed them into our musical culture to the degree that Jester's helping us to do with the, the kind of free outburst of emotion that he can elicit from a group. Now, Jester is known for, work, for, for working with white choirs and helping them understand and sing black spirituals. I, I want to explore again the uniqueness of, again, the, the, the perception of the choirs, the predominantly white choir, and now trying to sing black. How do those two mesh? Can we explore that a little bit more? Well, when we approach music from our, our training and our point of view, we work the technical things first to get the rhythm and the notes and that sort of thing. But when Jester works with a spiritual, that's important to him. But what's more important is the spirit of it, the essence of that spontaneous joy that comes with a spiritual. And so he'll, he'll do a lot of things to try to elicit that from the choir as he goes through the series of rehearsals that he has with us. Um, let's stop tape for a minute. Um, anecdotes. Do you remember any specific funny little things, you know, through the years that... I remember where his mouth is. <laughs> How old was he? <laughs> oh, he was about 17, you know. Okay, the, the, not to be clever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he's... <laughs> we buried him shortly thereafter. <laughs> okay, let's roll tape. It would just be a guess of even being able to use the loop, so I'd rather just have it there. It's locked off right there. Locked off. Each question. Yep. Yep. No change. No change. Okay. Actually, can we go a little tighter? Let me see what it looks like. Jerry, I'm going to run through a lot of what we've done before because I've changed the angle, but also to explore a, little, a few other things. Um, oh, we wanted to pick up uh, gestures. What we were talking about? About his comments about people not sounding oh, black yeah, enough. Yeah, let's, let's, let's pick that up. All right. Uh, we got speed. One of the things that Jester often says when he's working with a white choir is that it just doesn't sound black enough and keeps working with the pronunciation of the text and the general tonal spirit of things until he gets it moving in that direction. And then he will say something like, yes, the color's changing, the color's changing. <laughs> Let's pick up that same comment again, Jerry. I like, you know, we're, we're exploring Jester's comments. When Jester's working with white choirs, he often becomes a little discouraged that they don't sound black enough. And will often say to, say to them that very thing, it's not black enough, it's not black enough. Then he'll work techniques with the text and tonal colors until he gets it coming to where he wants it to, to be and then he'll enliven everybody and turn them on by saying yes your colors changing your colors changing let's back up and talk about gesture gestures uh, uh, view or, or where he stands in the choral music world where does where, where does gestures <coughs> position in the choral music repertoire where, where is that How, well, Gesture is a monument all by himself, having been in the business for so long and having made such a contribution at the grassroots level. He's probably worked with more young people than any conductor living today on a first-person basis, teaching them what the spiritual means as well as how it sounds. Jerry, how important is that tradition of, of, of coming and teaching young people you know, this, this cultural identity the culturalness of the, of the Negro spiritual. I mean, that's being lost, isn't it? Yes, uh, in, I think that in this day and time when so much of the popular music is moving away from ethnicity to uh, social movement ideas that we need to preserve these great heritages that exist in our own society. We don't want to be a melting pot to the point that we lose everything that has flavored us for so many years. And that's been Jester's personal mission is to keep that spirit alive from the generations that he's not that far removed from who were actually slaves. And so, uh, then let's explore again. The, yeah. I can see a little bit of that. Uh, here's something. 
go for go for luck. Hey, Genja, I want to explore again what what the world tends to lose when when Jester passes along, uh, uh, as far as what he's accomplished teaching his the music as he's only he has it's done to, uh, to, to 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 the youth. Unfortunately, there aren't many people who have the same feeling for the spiritual that he does because of his roots so closely associated with slavery himself through his grandparents. Uh, there are those who are trying to, to uh, retain the spirit of the spiritual in our musical society, but the gospel side of Afro-American music is taking over to such a degree that not many people are singing pure spirituals anymore. And uh, if someone doesn't take up the cudgel after Jester is gone, uh, we'll lose a lot of that. There is one or two people like uh, Albert McNeil and the other man who's going working with us this week, uh, Eugene Simpson, who are uh, doing a good job retaining the, the spirit. One of the problems with black music is that the tunes and the ideas are so captivating that everybody wants to rearrange them and they overarrange them. They become too sophisticated and lose some of that spontaneous naturalness that Jester's arrangements have and which in the, the naturalness that he's taught through the years. That's great. Let's look at, um, again from this angle, how, how Jester works with, with, with the choir. What, what do you anticipate, again, we're speaking of the past tense, he's already, he's already done it. We are right. Well, Jester uses a lot of examples from the slave culture, even from the African culture, to highlight the ideas that he's trying to get musically from the choir. So he'll do a lot of talking, giving examples, demonstrating body movements, demonstrating even the shape of a phrase. Rather than conducting, he'll demonstrate phraseologies, uh, which is a kind of a unique approach, more emotional than it is technical. Let's see. Again, cover the ideas of the uniqueness of the, of, the, of the tabernacle choir singing spirituals. What makes it difficult? What makes it unique? You know, perceptions of people of the choir of singing spirituals. The tabernacle choir has a little difficulty coming to grips with this kind of music. First of all, it's so large. That's difficult for any choir this big to get into the spirit of the, the music because the music has to be uh, rather spontaneous and not too formalized, but to keep us together we have to be quite four square. Uh, so it, it's going to depend a lot on how much Jester can, through the, these rehearsals that he's working with us in, elicit the natural spirit of the individuals in the choir to step forward and put their intellectual understanding of music behind themselves. That was a convoluted answer. Let's, well, let's try it. Let's try it again. <laughs> let's, let's approach it again. Let's I don't know what'll come out. That's so. fine. Let's let's approach that again. Is how he'll work with the choir. Uh, Jester works in a very casual kind of way, giving lots of examples, and talking about the nature of the culture as much as he does about the nature of the music. Uh, the Tabernacle Choir is much more formal than the people who usually sing this kind of music. So it takes a while to bring their personalities forward and sublimate the technical aspects of the music for the spirit. Um, we would, in, in, in the other answer, we were exploring more about the difficulties. Uh, and I want to get into it a little bit more about people's perception of the ability of a choir to sound black. I mean, they're so, again, the choir is so associated with a certain kind of music. How is the perception of singing spirituals, how will that be perceived, do you think? Are you speaking in terms of the audi uh, yeah, a general audience? The audience at this point. Uh, 25 years ago, the general listening audience of the Tabernacle Choir might have been a little bit scandalized if they did too many spirituals because not only did our culture not understand the spiritual very well, but we hadn't absorbed it here in the West very much. But since that time, we've explored 
all kinds of literature, popular, nostalgic, and uh, and to a greater, much greater degree, the spiritual itself. So I think the listening public is more ready to accept the Tabernacle Choir in this mold than they would have been before. Okay. Um, can we cover again? And I, each time I ask, I know it'll come through different. I want to get uh, Jester. How Jester's? Well, I'm covering the same oh, stuff okay. we did in the wide, okay. in, the, in the wide shots. Um, uh, again, how the importance of gesture to choral music? I want to cover that again from, from whatever different perspective it may come out this time. Jester Hairston has been a. Uh, let's try it again. Jester Hairston has been a billboard name in choral music for as long as I can remember. Uh, he's been around a very, very long while, and he's been presenting a point of view that uh, was different and exciting, and people recognize as being very important because it was adding to the understanding of a culture that we didn't understand very well. Uh, when he leaves this life, <coughs> I'm sorry. That's right. That's what happens, it happens. <coughs> Bring a note from your mother, please. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> when he leaves. When Jest Jester passes away, he's going to leave a great void because of his personal connection to the whole Afro-American movement through his slave grandparents remembering them well and hearing the stories from their lips of what it was like to be a slave. Uh, there will be no one to carry that spirit into the musical presentation of the spirituals except a few of his devotees like Albert McNeil out of Los Angeles and, and uh, Eugene Simpson who is also working with us this week and some others who are capturing it but not nearly as first person as Jester did. So his monument will have to stand as an example to all of us. How much time we got? Let's change over. So this, this, these are 60s, right? Oh. 69 lows? Oh, yeah, that's right. These are 60s. Yeah. Are they white? Yeah. Right. No problem. Yeah. 30 minutes left. Yeah, 30 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got five minutes left in our time. Um, Is there any other perspective? How, how, let's 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 assume Jester's already worked with the choir. Can you reflect back now on on, on commenting how, how how Jester works again with 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 his music with the choir, or how he's done it, as if we were doing this tomorrow? Now you're looking back at what we did last night. Well, in the rehearsal, Jester used a lot of examples from the history of the slaves, the Afro-American people, uh, bringing poignant stories about how the music developed from life experiences, uh, bringing the, the essence of the music up into the emotional arena rather than into the intellectual arena. And I think that's the only way that a, a white choir can really establish a connection to the black music is to feel what these people were feeling when they sang these songs. I like that. That's, that, that's important. Can you feel of anything? I, I've covered pretty much what I what intended. Is there anything else, perhaps a question I haven't asked, some perspective of Jester that uh, we have? Let me share my description of Jester. Okay. I've often been asked by people to describe Jester Hairston, and, and spontaneously once I described him as being a little, little black leprechaun, and I think that's the spirit of Jester Hairston. Carries all that charm, and yet it can uh, amalgamate it with the essence of being black, and that helps us, those of us who are not black to understand what it's all about. Thing, that whole answer again. Oh. That's wider. Yeah, let's go wider. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know where what I did. <laughs> okay, we're rolling again. Got a 
settle in and we're covering Jester's description. Sometimes I've, I'm asked to describe Jester Harrison, and the, spontaneously I came up with this analogy. I, let's try to, analogy is not right, it's a description. I'm sometimes asked to describe Jester Hairston, and one time, spontaneously, I came up with this description. He reminds me of a little black leprechaun. He has all of that charming spirit of a leprechaun amalgamated with the unique spirit of blackness, which we don't understand very well. But he's an example just in his own being that helps us to understand what that is. Okay, and I want you to think about it. Stand up for a second. I like that answer, and it comes out different each time. <clears throat> nice, and we're rolling, and... I've been asked on many occasions to describe Jester Harrison, and spontaneously I once said that he's like a little black leprechaun. He's small of stature, full of vitality and personality, and yet has that essence which constitutes blackness in that combination that's very intriguing and almost beguiling to people who don't understand what it is to be black. 